My brothers and sisters, on the heel of a turbulent election, we come together as Christians to, to pray. For our country to reunite as one nation under God, demonstrating grace and reverence for one another. For baby Lincoln and his mother. Lincoln was born premature, but at only one pound and 11 ounces, he is doing well, but he has a long road. And his mother is also doing well, but she's exhausted already and it will be a lengthy process until the baby is well enough to go home. A friend has asked that he would be able to come back to an old friend who he has abandoned and make a new relationship. For my friend who's still in the hospital after a serious car, week, car wreck, please help her get out soon of ICU. My mom is struggling with COPD and deep loneliness brought on by COVID. Please give her hope and strength to get her back to her old self. I need to find an apartment within my budget. I've looked everywhere and now I need God's help. For guidance and wisdom in my current relationship, may we both follow God's plan. For my sister who is recently divorced, please give her healing and protection. For those impacted by the fires in Colorado and California and everywhere, please help the fires end soon and help them find semblance of their old life. That patriotism will override political division and that people will be able to realize that they are joined together in God. For a friend who right now is struggling with depression, that they find a way to get back connected with their God and with their family. And finally, grant us the grace and direction to reunite in service to God's will. We offer these prayers up in your name. We know that this is a trying time for many people, trying to re-knit the bonds of society, civility, and Christian brotherhood. Please God, help us come together as we always do as Christians conjoined in the faith and the role model of you, understanding that for every season there is a time, but also understanding that sometime it's your will that makes sense, not ours. Help us to defer to your will, to be your hands and feet, and to actively work to make your plan tangible and manifested in the now. We offer all these prayers in your name. Amen. Greetings and welcome. Well, we just did our prayer requests. I need to make an admission. This is the first time that I've actually redacted some prayers, not put in requests that people sent me. And part of it was, some of it, as you would imagine, is very much around the current political situation that we're in. And it didn't make sense to me in what we were doing to necessarily say that we would pray for a particular outcome of the election. Part of that is that we had conflicting people's views on outcome of election, and truly, friends, what we know right now is that, as a country, the constant we have is that we are really, really at odds in a fairly uniform way. We are diametrically opposed with different concepts of vision of the world and of our country. So we come together in this broadcast from the Martin Meditation Chapel here on the campus of Ottawa University in Ottawa, Kansas. And what we want to work on is common ground. Now, last week I told you that I wanted to start exploring what we could do to sort of work on things together, to do a show and tell of some different people, and that's still my intent. But because of where the election is today, it, it seemed to me that it would make no sense not to address very, very concretely with where it is and where we are, not just personally but collectively as a country. Because where we know we are is that we are about 50-50 within our view of things. And we talked uh, the last week about seeking first, seek ye first, about what would Jesus do, about letting go and letting go. And, and all that I want you to think about. But today I'd like to start us out with having you really think about want, need, and desire. What I determined, just because I can, not because I'm always right, is that it sounded too wanty 
to talk about a particular outcome in an election, to have us all collectively pray for something that some people wanted and some did not. Now, as we listen to scripture today, you'll hear Haley and she'll read something that talks about want and need. You'll hear Jan and she'll talk about want and desire. <clears throat> Those things can many times be in conflict. As Christians, there are things that we need to do, but there's also things as humans that we want and desire. And that makes perfect sense. That's how we are built. That becomes an issue then when you think about next steps after election, which is how do we come together as common family? Now, that can be God or that can be country. I mean, certainly we're Americans. A lot of us are. And that's a big deal. But one way or the other, we are called then out of need to come together. Early on, we talked about all being parts of the body of Christ, and some of those parts are desirable and some are not as desirable and require special treatment. At the end of the day, in the people we interact with, just like that metaphor, some of us are eyes and some of us are armpits. There are less desirable body parts to deal with, but we are called within community, in country and in faith, to come together and to share the commonality, the privilege of what it's like to be an American or a Christian. And that's not just Christian faith, that's any faith. It could be the same for our Jewish brothers and sisters, the same for our Muslim brothers and sisters. We're called to conjoin under God's umbrella of want, need, and desire. So the real question then, and the reason that I wanted to talk about it in this chapel, is what do we do next week? How do we get past, regardless of who wins this election, how do we get back into being a people of God? And, and more importantly, how do we make sure we are a people of God? That we give Caesar what is Caesar and God what is due God. I would challenge all of you that at the end of the day, what is keeping you awake at night right now is the political process or whether or not your candidate won, that I'm not sure in your seeking first of things that you've put God foremost. What should be keeping you awake at night is God's plan and how within our circle of influence and circle of concern, we can actively promote that. We can make it into something that we can influence. And we can, by the way. And that includes bringing disparate body parts together. That includes dealing with people that you don't like under the love of country or the love of God. That is collegiality in its best sense that we all can share a pew or share a parade and celebrate what it's like to be conjoined in those ways. With the cautious note that at the end of the day you cannot do that, I would question your commitment to country or to God. God should be first. I think for a lot of us, country is right under there. If somehow there's anything else, then I think that probably is part of your charge because we will be charged soon to come together as common family under those auspices, God and country, to make a difference in the world, to solve the problems. Remember, we have the commandments, the Big Ten, and they tell us what we should, should do and not do. We have the great commandment, mouth of Jesus himself, talking about loving the Lord God above all things with all our heart, and mind, and soul, loving our neighbors, ourself. That's where we're called. We have the Sermon on the Mount. We talk about the Beatitudes and where God wants us to be mindful. We have his conversations with Peter. We have to take care of the flock. We know what we're supposed to do. And if any of the things that you're sort of broiling with within politics does not support those things, then what that means is your priorities might need to be reexamined. What would Jesus do? And when we've done as much as we can, especially within system and process, things like elections, where we've voted, our friends have voted, others have voted, and those things are counted, tallied, and the thing is set. How do we let go and let God? There's no better practical application I can give you than what's going on this week in everyone's heart in this country, because we don't know. We have to look for ways that we could do what Jesus would do, and we have to be prepared to let go and let God, because the outcome may not be one that we want. 
might be what we need. may not be one we desire. But it doesn't really matter because where we are called is to come back together as body parts, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as Americans, to see where we can make a difference and do God's work. As we talk about our message today, we'll get into that more deeply. Listen to scripture and listen for those areas of want, need, and desire so that we can ponder together, collectively and individually, but together in the now. Where does God call us to have perspective? Where do we really have the ability to step back enough that our feelings do not necessarily get in the way of the charge that God has given us, the privilege of what it's like to be American and to be Christian? And that will be our focus today. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, these are sort of amazing and kind of difficult times. It is good that we can spend them together to ponder and to pray and to wonder and hopefully to come up with solutions on how we can live more closely as humans and more closely in the plan of God. Welcome. Romans 7, 14 through 20. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. What wondrous love is this, O oh, my soul, O oh, my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh, my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul? To bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down. When I was sinking down, oh my soul. When I was sinking down beneath God's righteousness. The crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. To God, to the Lamb, I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb. God and to the Lamb who is the great I am. While millions join the theme, I will sing, I will sing. While millions join the theme, I will When from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing in joyful be through all eternity. 
sea I'll sing on, I'll sing on Through all eternity I'll sing on See how my enemies persecute me. Have mercy and lift me up from the gates of death, that I may declare your praises in the gates of daughter Zion, and there rejoice in your salvation. The nations have fallen into the pit they have dug. Their feet are caught in the net they have hidden. The Lord is known by the acts of justice. The wicked are ensnared by the work of their hands. The wicked go down to re um, of the death or of the dead all the nations that forget God. But God will never forget the needy. The hope of the afflicted will never perish. Arise, Lord, do not let mortals trumpet. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror, Lord. Let the nations know they are only mortal. So, you've heard a little bit about want, need, and desire within our scripture. Certainly, we talked in Psalms about being persecuted by enemies and how we wanted to sort of be emancipated and rescued from that and and how in some ways you have that chunk of it and then you have a whole piece about God not forgetting the needy, talking about hope of the afflicted, all that humanness, that God stuff that goes in it. And in Romans, we heard about how we really want to do something, but it's so hard to do what we want to do. In some ways, we need to do it, but desire steps in. So I'm prevented by myself from doing what needs to be done. Boy, how are we living in those times now? What I would tell you is, in the realm of justice and fairness and mercy and redemption, which is our plan, justice going into fairness, what becomes an interesting stumbling block is righteousness. Now, righteousness, per the Magic Dictionary, the quality of being morally right or justifiable. Righteousness. Sometimes we can feel righteous without being righteous. Because there's a quantifier there that we sort of have to know that right, the root of said word, is righteous. There's some interesting scriptural cautions in that. One of my favorite talks about, before you talk about the splinter in your brother's eye, you have to remove the plank from your own. Remember we talked about influence and concern. That is so tempting. It's really easy to squint and see that splinter and not realize that we have something huge blinding us. Many times that blinding comes from the very feelings that we have, and that can be righteous. That, and many times you have righteous indignation, the indignation that comes from being righteous. How dare you? How could you? How would you? That is permission then to cast the first stone. The time where Jesus says that only those of us who are truly sinless can doesn't mean that we aren't really tempted to do it. One, two, three. Uh, when do you stay your hand and when do you just toss it? Because it feels righteous and your enemies have persecuted you. That is a struggle for us as humans. Even further than in scripture, in Matthew there's discussion of you're bringing your gift to the altar, which is different than throwing your stone. I have this cool gift, Father God. I want to give it to you. And we have to make peace with our brother if there's an issue. Well, that's silly. 
why should we have to worry about that? I've got this cool gift. It's very much the concept of going into Thanksgiving time and having the perfect side dish and having your parents say, wait, 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 wait. Before you put that on the table, I've heard you and your sister are not getting along. So why don't you go make peace, then you can come to dinner. Does that sort of make sense? Yes. Otherwise, dinner is a pretty intense, intense experience. That unsaid thing preventing you from truly enjoying your turkey and mashed potatoes. That unspoken thing causing strained conversation. Now, in my particular household, we've always had a rule not to talk about politics. But I think for a lot of people, they do. What do you do if that extension of struggling with your brother and sister metaphorically, those that are conjoined with us in the privilege of being Christian or American, extends into your family relationships if you and your mom or your dad don't agree on politics, no matter how this election comes out? What if you feel that it was the very wrong choice as a collective community by a very small majority and they feel that it was very much the right choice that was righteous and that it gave us the candidate we should have. How do you make peace? I'll tell you, you don't. In some ways, you find perspective. You understand what's truly important in family, and in my case, in food. You don't try to win the other person over to the perspective you want them to have or desire them to have. You need to come together as family, as we need to come together as country, or as faith brethren, because that's what we need to do. And with that, there's a diversity that comes that says we do not need to agree, but we have to rebuild. That in itself is the birth pangs of a new nation. To fulfill those beatitudes, to be able to feed people and clothe people and visit those in prison, we have to come together. All body parts are necessary. And no matter what happens with the results of the election tomorrow, those needs are knocking at our door. People are naked now. They're hungry. They're thirsty. And for those that consider themselves Christians, we know that whatever we do to those people, we potentially do to the extension of God himself. Whatever we do to the least of our brothers, we do to God. That is what I hope is keeping you awake at night now. That is much more important in giving God what is God than giving Caesar what is Caesar, than the collective process. The privilege of living in a democracy says, that there is a vote. Sometimes they're really close, although granted this one's closer than most. And in this case, half people are sad and half are happy. But it's not a competition. It's a collective. It's a democracy. It's how we come together. If we do not have the ability to do that, if, if we can't get past the plank in our eye, if we only focus on the speck, if we cannot leave our gift at the altar, then the very call that we have to be the hands and feet of God, and to go to the vineyard, to tend to the sheep, all the things that Christians are called to do, go by the wayside. We fail to produce good fruit. And that takes you into scripture prior to the time of Jesus where you hear things like vipers brood. Who warned you of the coming retribution? Prove your repentance by the fruit it bears. Things like those that fail to produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. And probably most strongly, that God can make children of Abraham out of the stones at his feet. So our privilege is not nearly as important as we think if we don't do what we need to do. Now, that doesn't mean that want and desire don't knock loudly on the door. It doesn't mean that you feel them in your heart, in your mind, but you should not feel them in your soul because your soul should be God's as we love him with all our heart and all of our mind and all of ourself and put nothing else above him. So your charge today is a simple one and a hard one. 
no matter where you fell on this particular political spectrum, we will be called as Christians to rebuild this country in the image of what God intends for us soon, now. And that will come with sleeves up, circle of influence. That will not change your circle of concern. And if the candidate that wins is someone that you endorse and that you hope for, you'll be a lot happier, frankly. But none of that changes the need. God's need is instantaneous, immediate, and ongoing. And the consequences of not responding to that, scripturally, are not good. Is that a threat? Is that about damnation? Or redemption. No, we'll talk about redemption later. That's merely a consequence. As we talked in our first chapel this session, consequence is not a punishment. It is consequence. It's reaping what we sow. It's seeing what happens when we sow things on ground that is too hard for the seed to find purchase or too unprotected for the birds or the weeds, and we live in a world of birds and weeds. But we have the choice whether or not we are those things or we are the protectors. We need to nourish God's plan. We may want to be a bird or a weed. It's human. We may want to show justice. We may want them to get theirs. We may. Your charge then is to make sure that when you feel that way, you put your mind where? God. God's kingdom and righteousness. As we heard the song closing last time, all those things that are added unto you, not just so that you're worthy to experience the presence of God, but so that you're equipped to, so that you can sit in a room of fellow Americans and fellow Christians and not judge the color of their skin but the content of their character and that they would do the same for you because in that charge you will truly experience the wonder in each of us that God has in us why he made us to be as we are how we're all body parts of Christ and how the only way we really fit is not politically, is not socially, but through God's plan. Let us pray then. God, it's been an interesting week. The political process which gives us the privilege of being American has not brought us naturally together. As a people then, we are torn asunder in our beliefs neighbor against neighbor. It is easy for us to think that maybe when one spins, one will be taken, one will be left. Those working in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. And to actually think about, we'll be the one being rewarded. Help us be mindful of our brothers and sisters, more mindful than we are ourselves. We know that we are your hands and feet. Let us keep an ear out for the cries of those in need. Let us keep our hearts soft for the cries of those in need who may seem arrogant or who may take us for granted or who may ask us for something they have no right to. In the times when we are called, help us to go to the vineyard even when we do not want to. Help us to go the extra mile, even though the law does not require it. Help us to take off our coat and give it to those naked people, even if they do not seem to deserve it. And most importantly, help us find perspective in the weeks, in the months to come, to really recognize what it's like to be conjoined with other body parts in the service of Christ and don't necessarily decide which one's better than the others, but just focus on being the best body part we can 
and helping others to do the same. We ask for grace because what we want and what we desire are not necessarily conjoined now with what we need, what the world needs, what the country needs. But we know that you have a plan and that we need to participate in it. Please help us stay focused on your plan and not brought down into the noise of the world. Please help us stay focused on your plan and be a part of making it happen so that it's not just our concern, but a clear path, a clear path of influence. And help us to do that in a way that Jesus would do. We ask for strength and grace, more so maybe than you think we deserve. Sometimes it's hard for us to not be childish. Help us be childlike to see the wonder of this time as an opportunity and help us to sleep at night and let go and let God any of the frustration that this process has caused us because we are grateful to live in a free country with free choice. Thank you. Help us. Amen. There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see Yeah.